Um, our second talk is going to be by Bafna Aurora, um, and she is at Lawrence uh, Berkeley National Lab, um, and she will be talking about modeling approaches for providing water and energy solutions to the world. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to um, be talking or focusing more on reactive transport. Yeah, there we go. OK, so I'm going to be talking more about reactive transport models as um, you know, these set of interpretive tools um, that have a way to unravel complex interactions be between uh, physical, chemical, and biological processes. So as opposed to ordinary transport solutions, you might think that in reactive transport, we'll have solutions for flow transport, but also something like uh, reactions like microbially mediated redox reactions, uh, mineral um, dissolution and precipitation reactions, uh, aqueous reactions, and so on. So what does that mean for a broader scale? So think about watershed scale processes. That would mean that we solve for uh, the flow, uh, subsurface flow, and that we get into, uh, into something like what is the carbon distribution within the watershed? Uh, or we get into the nitrogen cycling at this scale. Uh, we can also do salinity, like Julia was talking about, for her coastal systems. Um, so there are several modern reactive transport models. And you might ask, which one do I use? Um, as the table uh, here shows, I've listed multiple set of these uh, reactive transport models. So all of them essentially solve the same governing equations, but they might differ in their capabilities. So like I showed in the first slide, some of them may solve for that unsaturated flow. Um, so they'll solve for Richard's equation, and some of them might not. Um, there's also the possibility of uh, capturing gas phase diffusion, which becomes important for these uh, reactive transport models. Similarly, they may be differentiated in terms of the geochemical and microbial capabilities that they have. Um, for example, they may have electrostatic correction for surface complexation models, um, and they might also vary in terms of the numerical capabilities. So some of these codes are paralyzed, uh, while others are not. So a lot of different nuances to them. Um, if you are interested, uh, Carl Stiefel actually published a very nice review paper in 2015. So do get uh, check that out. So reactive transport models so far have been used to solve a broad range of environmental problems. They've been used for um, you know, nuclear storage uh, contamination, aquifer contamination, geochemical weathering over longer time scales, carbon and nutrient cycling. Um, the figure on the right actually shows work by Lili, which in the, the red oval kind of shows what reactive transport models have been used 
to solve so far and the bigger role that they may be prodded to take upon. Um, so we're really interested in expanding the role of those reactive transport models. But in short, you know, these earth system applications or larger scale applications can really benefit from the use of this uh, reactive transport modeling because it can explore this tight coupling of physical, chemical, and biological processes. Now, the talk that I had today, um, I want to ask, can I showcase some examples where these models have been used to provide engineering solutions for the future? So I want to give one example that focus on uh, groundwater management. The image that you're seeing is uh, from California um, using gray satellite. And so you can see over the years, um, you know, it, it's getting red, which means that the groundwater storage has declined in California. And California actually came up with a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, which allows that we better ma manage our groundwater resources by using surface water um, to supplement um, groundwater during the wetter years. So we supply some of that water um, in, into the groundwater basins. And one um, of these approaches is thinking about putting the surface water um, in uh, croplands to recharge the underlying aquifers. Um, now in croplands, of course, this is a big problem because we've uh, overdrawn the groundwater quite a bit. So it makes for a perf uh, perfect place uh, to be supplementing um, the surface waters. And there are several key benefits uh, to the adoption of AGMAR. Uh, first of all, it's a very low cost, low energy water supply option. It's also natural treatment to replenish these overexploited aquifers. Um, when we take up the water from surface, we are preventing that water lost or runoff to the oceans. Um, it also helps us manage extremes in surface water supply because we're taking the surface water supply during the wetter years. Um, and you can read, there are so many other advantages. It prevents algal blooms, it helps, uh, it can be scaled up over time to provide additional benefits. You could have multiple farms that are doing it together. So if this approach is so great, what's, what's hindering us back? One of the important outstanding science questions is, when you put the surface water on agricultural spaces, what's going to happen to the fertilizer residues? So as we know, uh, you know, farmers do apply nitrate uh, fertilizers, and some of that, most of it, is actually taken up by plants, but some of it is left behind as residues within the croplands. So with that nitrate, is it getting, um, you know, when we flood the, the cropland, is it going to get leached to groundwater and create more problems? Because nitrate in groundwater can create uh, blue baby syndrome and other types of liver and um, cancers. Um, or, you know, is that nitrate actually going to denitrify in place and be lost to the, at or is it going to be lost to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide or a greenhouse gas? So two of those options are not very good. Uh, the only thing we want is denitrification in place, which means that uh, nitrate gets reduced to um, lesser uh, contaminated forms uh, of NO. So um, we focused our work in the Central Valley, which is uh, a $46 billion industry in California. Um, and we looked at a field site in Modesto where you can see the um, the almond site being flooded in the in the image on the right, and the um, the soil type is fine sandy loam. The groundwater table is really deep, about ten to fifteen meters deep, at the site. So we developed uh, this um, reactive transport model to support you know what's going to happen to that nitrate residues uh, when we apply Agmar. Um, so the image on the bottom shows you an ERT or geophysical survey of the site. And it basically shows you how heterogeneous this field is. So there are places uh, which have higher permeabilities, 
um, and sand with silt channels. And then there are other places uh, which have lower permeability, such as silt with sand channel. Um, so uh, what we did was we simplified that and we said, we're going to test five different stratigraphies. We're going to go with a homogeneous sandy loam uh, column and homogeneous silt loam column and two other columns with different channels, similar to our field site. So a sandy loam column with, with um, silt channel in between and a silt channel with uh, sandy loam uh, in between. And then something that mimics our entire field where we have um, you know, two uh, reducing layers on the side, but we have a preferential flow path in the center. And the question is, you know, can we really get nitrate to denitrify um, and what are the rates for that? What kind of, um, you know, in which of these soil stratigraphic configurations do we prevent the nitrate from leaching into the groundwater? So how we set up the reactive transport model is we had a 2D transect. It was 20 meters deep by um, almost 200 meters wide. Um, and we actually had a bigger um, field site and we set it up to um, you know, 500 wood blocks uh, and we ran it for, for multiple days until it achieved um, you know, stable profiles. And then we tested this for over 60 days. So on the results, what you're seeing is, I just wanna zoom into the, the focus of, of what we achieved. So in this one, this is a, a sandy loam with the silt loam channel. So whenever the silt loam existed, nitrate was actually not getting leached down it was getting more denitrified because the permeability was slower and it was allowing the reaction to proceed at a much faster zone. So these fine texture soils by themselves or embedded even with, within higher permeability zones were important to keep the nitrate in place. On the other hand, wherever we saw the sandy loam or these coaster texture soils, they promoted greater leaching to the groundwater. So that answers our first question. The second question that we asked was, how uh, do we apply this water? Do we apply 60 centimeters of water all at once? Do we break this down into multiple weeks? So we kept the same amount of water, but we did one application um, per week, or we did one application every other week. So what is that duration, frequency, and amount of water that would reduce, again, nitrate leaching to groundwater? And our results suggest that um, the, the red one, which was all at once application, uh, resulted in greater denitrification in, our, uh, in all our stratigraphic columns, which are listed on the bottom here. So the longer the site is waterlogged, greater are the denitrification rates. But we also found that the transport, because we're applying so much water at once, uh, to the transport of nitrate to deeper depths is also greater. Because our groundwater was so deep, like it was 15 to 20 meters deep, um, you know, it prevented that nitrate to actually um, go into the groundwater. But this also tells us that there is a threshold, or you could play with these uh, duration and frequencies of water applications for each individual site. So reactive transport model definitely offers us this possibility uh, to explore these interactions in different microbial pathways depending on your site. So just to summarize the findings so far, uh, what we found was how um, you know, Agmar application choices work with different site stratigraphy and how even um, antecedent soil moisture conditions influence the amount of nitrate leaching that we see in these systems. And under uh, Agmar, what we found was that finer textured sediments, such as silt loams, were important reducing zones that were acting as permanent sinks of nitrate via denitrification. And uh, the, the last part here is showing that applying large amounts of water all at once under Agmar was a much better strategy uh, for preventing nitrate leaching into the groundwater than doing so in smaller increments over time. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that with these modeling techniques, you could design that ideal Agmar scenario uh, for your particular site. The second application that I want to focus on is a nature-based solution uh, for carbon dioxide removal. 
this is called surficial enhanced weathering and enhanced rock weathering basically works where you have silicate rocks that are rich in calcium and magnesium ions and you spread them on large lands such as agricultural lands or working lands and what that does is when you put these rocks in really fine particles, they're going to take up carbon dioxide and the calcium and magnesium ions in them are going to form uh, calcite or magnesite, or they're going to transport the bicarbonate alkalinity into the oceans. So enhanced rock weathering is a really competitive option that combines both carbon capture and storage. Um, so as you can see on the figure, um, there's also direct air capture on the top, there's biochar, there's bioenergy. So a very competitive option uh, for carbon dioxide removal. Um, again, some outstanding science questions uh, with this is, what is that rock weathering rate going to be when you do an actual application for a site? Can we accelerate it by any means? Can we keep that high rate for a longer time and what are the long-term impacts going to be? So we focused on very simple questions uh, with our reactive transport modeling. We were like, if we had to go to a farmer and say, use this technique, can we even say what soil conditions uh, do we achieve the highest rates of carbon sequestration? What infiltration rate should be there? How much water should be applied? What depth do you apply these rocks to? Um, what is the surface area? How fine do you want to grind those rocks? Um, and again, what are the soil hydrological pro uh, properties that promote uh, more CO2 sequestration? So very simple model again. Uh, we took a 1D uh, model using Tough React and we applied this phosphorite rock on the top 15 centimeter and we put a water table at two meters depth. And we said with that one application, you would, with one ton of rock application, you would expect 0.625 ton of CO2 getting sequestered based on that chemical equation. But can we uh, optimize these rates? So our results, I, I don't want to bore you with all the details that we have uh, here, but what we found was well-drained soils such as sandy loams really promoted a lot more CO2 sequestration. So in the figure on the bottom, you see the phosphorite uh, rock application that's on the right. I'm sorry, the image doesn't show, it's not very clear, uh, but the blue line is for sandy loam at 200 millimeters per year, and the red line is for silt loam at the higher infiltration rate of 2,000 millimeters per year. Um, so, so the faster one is sandy loam at the lowest infiltration rates. So you might think, why are, am I getting more sequestration in the well-drained soils with lower infiltration rates. It's all about how much CO2 can be supplied to the soil. If the pores are filled with water, like in a silty loam column, you might get lesser CO2 sequestration. Uh, but again, all of this was done under steady hydrologic conditions, and we're following up with uh, varying precipitation temperature profiles, which is another interesting study. Uh, but I just want to summarize to say under Agmar, we found that fine texture soils were more important uh, as permanent sinks of nitrate for denitrification. For enhanced weathering, we found the exact opposite. We found that coarse texture soils uh, provide more potential for CO2 sequestration. Uh, but models can definitely reduce some of this uncertainty associated with the climate change projections and help with these engineering solutions. Um, I want to thank my collaborators and funders but I also want to say I'm looking for a postdoc. If this interested you, please uh, do reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I, there's a lot of talk about using olivine on salt marshes um, to increase carbon carbon capture, and I think you showed a ton of a ton of olivine uh, sequestered 0.6 tons of carbon dioxide. And I don't know if you know this, how much carbon is generated by mining a ton of olivine? Very good question. So we we do have with this project we did do a life cycle analysis of that. And we are actually getting, um, you know, olivine minerals do a really good job with the grinding and crushing. We still get a good amount of sequestration. 
I don't have the data on hand, but we were able to make it, uh, in terms of, of costs, it was almost $51 per ton of rock applied, but we were still able to get a, a carbon dioxide uh, reduction potential with those types. Any other questions? Um, I'm just imagining flooding the fields with water. Are, are the fields there naturally, I guess, a, a basin, or would you have to construct dikes around the fields? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So um, in the flooding that we did, um, farmers had been doing it for quite a bit of time. So you saw an image. Um, let me go back to that one. But yes, um, you can do dikes and Agmar type of, um, the different MAR options will come with different costs associated. You know, do you have to construct dikes for that particular field site? Do you have to do any other management to get the surface water to your field? So all of those are very valid questions. In this case, that wasn't the case. It, it already existed for us. You mentioned hydrologic variability. Um, it's, it's your simulations were steady state, right? For how the much, method, how right. much do you think they would change the picture? Because I would expect you need to have enough mm -hmm. water for the solution to happen mm -hmm. and, and yes, leaching for, for the alkalinity to go away from the soil. Yeah, so, so with the transient conditions, we are actually about to submit that publication. With transient precipitation, we actually found lower rates of sequestration, because whenever the soil was too wet, you wouldn't have enough CO2 in the pores for the rocks to take up. So that was, and during the dry out days, there wasn't enough water for the reaction to occur. So in both, you know, uh, yeah, in the transient precipitation cases, we were getting lower rates of weathering. But again, it depends upon, uh, you know, what your soil texture is, and how much does it retain water and the like. CO2 could, come, CO2 could come from roots, from biological activity, not necessarily only from, from, from the that's atmosphere. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So in the model, we do have a very comprehensive microbially mediated reaction network that would produce CO2 as well. But whenever we talk about CDR potential, people want us to focus on the CO2 that's coming from the atmosphere. Uh, but the other thing is that with this type of technique, the most CO2 sequestration that happens is also from the atmosphere. So in the applications, we, we applied the rock on the top few centimeters, and that's where we were getting the most sequestration. So it's really in contact with the atmosphere. Thank you. <laughs>